Thank you once again. Please be seated. When Mr. McCoy called me earlier this week and asked if I'd be available to preach, my voice was about 12 octaves lower. And Mr. Mucus was all in here and my nose was all like this. And I, uh, so I'm thankful that the Lord has provided a measure of healing. I do have my, my Luden's uh, licorice and honey cough drop right here just in case. Um, those things happen once in a while, but it's good to be here. 2017. This year marks the 500th anniversary of the spark that ignited what is called the Protestant Reformation. October 31st, a humble monk by the name of Martin Luther went to a town of Wittenberg in Germany and had 95 uh, words or statements of, of, um, of purpose, you might say, and tapped them on the door of a church there. And the idea was that there would be debate brought about from that document. Well, what does it mean for us today as a church? What does the Protestant Reformation mean for us as Protestants? I mean, after all, we all know Roman Catholics. Maybe some are relatives. Are they really that different? I mean, if in our own community we know that there are a lot of Protestant churches that have services, help out with the Roman Catholic churches, is there really that much difference? After all, they use the Bible just like we do. They say that they, say that they are saved by faith. I mean, isn't that the same? What are the differences? This morning I want to take one aspect of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ and see what the Roman Catholic Church had done to it and what was the reaction of the Reformer some 500 years ago and finally, what are the dangers that exist to us today? I begin this morning with question number 44 out of the larger catechism. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? Answer, Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering himself a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of his people and in making continual intercession for them. Jesus Christ is our priest by reconciling us to God when he once died upon the cross and secondly, that he continually, even right now, acts in an intercessory way. He stands for us. He's our lawyer in front of the Father. Following our independent board meeting last fall in Lakeland, Florida, my wife and I drove up from Lakeland up to Ocala, or near Ocala, Florida, where my sister and her husband live, and uh, had to spend a few days with them uh, as is most Florida homes, uh, there are all of these little lizards going all over the outside. You know, they get around to the sun side, and because I have a 12-year-old granddaughter, or almost 12, she'll say, um, she loves animals. Bugs, fish, frogs, turtles. And so Grandpa and Grandma had to bring some of these lizards back up home. We smuggled them from Florida uh, back up into, uh, into Pennsylvania. What was so neat about them is that as they sat on the white caramel side of their house, those lizards were just almost caramel. And the downspot that they had running across the grass was black, and they'd sit on top of them, and they were almost black. And they'd sit up on the, on the tree, and they're blended with all types of little to various shades of brown. We did catch two, by the way, and we did successfully deliver them. We're familiar with the chameleon aspect in nature, like these lizards. And a lot of animals have that, where they are able to disguise themselves in the surroundings and yet remain as a lizard or whatever type of animal. But this chameleon-like effect is not only found in the animal world, but it's also proven quite useful in the ecclesiastical world. The Roman Catholic Church being one of the best examples 
This church's nefarious ability to adapt and to adjust according to their surroundings, according to the situations they find themselves in over the centuries, in the multitude of cultures, and yet remain the Roman Catholic Church is testimony to the powerful forces behind this institution. I want to begin by, this, by the looking this morning at one of the foundational building blocks of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's the parish priest. This man has always had tremendous control over the lives of his parishioners. The local population often views this man as their passport to heaven, because in essence, that's what they are taught. The priest has been given the power and the authority to celebrate six sacraments. The sacrament of baptism, confirmation, penance, matrimony, the Holy Eucharist, or the Mass, and the anointing of the sick, or extreme unction. And with all seven sacraments, the church, in essence, has authority and control over the lives from birth to death. From birth to death by those principles of authority. If we go back in time to just before the Reformation, to be sure the church, during the medieval times, during the uh, the years from 900 to 1,000 to 1,500, all the way up into that area, they truly taught that Christ's atonement on the cross was for the forgiveness of sins. They said Jesus died for our sins, but in practice, in practice, salvation was relegated to baptism only. For after baptism, church members had to atone for their own sins in a complex penitential system. The 16th century Roman Catholic Church had expounded the scriptures as to what was acceptable for the remission of sins. They said, these are the things that are acceptable before God in order for your sins to be forgiven. First was a step as an act of contrition which the sinner would pray for his forgiveness. Begins with that. Beyond the confession of sin, there was an admission of guilt. The sinner was expected to carry out some form of sacramental penance. He had to do something, all the way from flagellations to uh, too many things to count. Then the church would offer some form of indulgence as a way to expand the merits of the church. The idea of an indulgence is somewhat foreign to those of us who don't come from a Roman Catholic background. But in truth, indulgences are explained as being an extension of a draw upon the storehouse of merit, of merit which was acquired by Jesus Christ when he died. Take this picture as a bank. The bank is empty. And when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, his merit, his goodness, went into this bank. And of all the great people within the church over the centuries, their merit, their pluses, their good things were added to this bank. But for all of the others who are sinners, who deserve you know, judgment, the church has the ability to come along and say, if you do this, if you do this, if you pray this, if you say this, we can draw from the bank of good things, the merits of Christ, and all the saints before, and put them into your account. The tragedy of this time is that during these sell or the transfer of virtues, the Roman Catholic Church had really engaged in the selling of indulgences. Even to the point of, if you have, uh, for example, a big party coming up on Saturday, you could go to the priest and you could buy indulgences for the sins you're going to commit the following day. I can take out all the money I need to give to the priest in order that those pluses from the bank of virtues of Christ went into my account. So when the next day went on, or even that night, and I sinned terribly, the account would come out even. It would be balanced. Over the years, the criticism piled on the church because of this. 
And this chameleon-like church made some external changes to answer their opponents. Baptism still has remained the key to salvation. Without being baptized, you simply can't be saved. And when it comes to indulgences today, you can get one for yourself, and you can get one for somebody who's dead, but you can no longer pay for them. They were outlawed in 1567. However, listen to this, charitable contributions combined with other acts of goodness can get you an indulgence. You can't buy one. But if you give a charitable contribution, and if you do some good things, you can earn an indulgence. Now, for those of you who want to go out and buy an indulgence today, or do that today, you're only allowed for one indulgence per day per sin. So, pull that back. So how did the parish priest obtain such power, the spiritual responsibility and the authority? It came through what was referred to as sacerdotalism. Sacerdotalism is simply a system whereby the priest has been given the authority to act as a spiritual mediator between God and man. The church gives him a place to say, I can stand between God and you. I have that authority which has been given to me. Catholic priests, Catholic theologians, and other works justify this by saying that Jesus gave the keys to, to Peter, the keys of the kingdom, in order that these things could be accomplished. This is from the Douay Rheims Version, Roman Catholic Bible. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. By this succession, Jesus Christ gave the direct power from himself to Peter, and from Peter to everyone down this chain, through all of the popes, all the way down to the most lowest office, we would say, even the priest. It's interesting to note that today the pope is called the vicar of Christ, but for the first five centuries of church history, he wasn't called that. The vicar of Christ was the Holy Spirit, and it was the understanding, it was the Holy Spirit's power in training the disciples of Christ during that time. But once the Vicar of Christ title was transferred to the Pope, it began to imply the extraordinary holiness and the supreme universal primacy that existed in that office over all people. This man was Blessed Peter in the person of the Supreme Pontiff. He is Peter. He is the Apostle Peter in the form of today's Pope. And it's a sacerdotal authority that comes all the way down to the parish priest by what's called holy orders. And that's, remember, we said there are six that were given to the priest to do, but one he can't do, and that's holy orders. Listen, holy orders is the sacrament through which the mission entrusted by Christ to his apostles continues to be exercised in the church until the end time. Thus, it is the sacrament of apostolic ministry. He's been given this by the power of Christ to Peter in order that he could perform such work. Each level of ordination confers special graces. For example, the ability to preach is granted to deacons. The ability to act in the person of Christ to give the Mass granted to the priest. The ability of strength and grace given to bishops, which allows them to teach and lead the flock even to the point of dying as Christ died. So parishioners learn from their very earliest days that salvation is deposed and deposited in the Roman priesthood and is given through the sacraments. The sacraments are effectively, and it's called in Latin, 
They are ex operate operato, meaning the subjective condition of the priest and the subjective of condition of the recipient doesn't matter. The priest can be as wicked a man as he can be, and the people can be as wicked as they can be, but as long as the sacrament is performed properly, grace is given. Grace is given. The Catholic Catechism teaches that as soon as the institution narrative begins, in other words, this is my body, this is my blood, in the formation of the Mass, the Lord is actually present in the elements of the cup and the bread. Only a priest, only a bishop ordained in apostolic succession is qualified to administer the Eucharist or the Mass. And provided there is no obstacle placed in his way, every sacrament properly administered gives grace by the intended sacrament. If it's properly done, nothing barring it, grace is given by that. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the priests are mediators because the sinner cannot for himself draw near to God through Christ and obtain pardon and grace, but can secure those blessings only through the priest interventions. They're saying, you as, as lay people do not have the ability to draw near to Christ, but for the priest who stands for you, he has the ability to intervene on your behalf to draw near to Christ. Do, do you understand the picture of how these people were feeling before the Reformation? The things we've come to know and expect and appreciate and enjoy as being believers, you're saying, no, you're cut off. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. You don't know. The Reformers saw the Roman Catholic priesthood as standing between believers and their God, not facilitating salvation, not making it possible, but prohibiting salvation, closing the door from them. John Calvin said, it is the most wicked infamy and unbearable blasphemy, both against Christ and against the sacrifice that Christ made for us through his death on the cross. For anyone to suppose that right by repeating the oblation, in other words, repeating the mass, he obtains pardon for sins, that he appeases God and he acquires righteousness. He said, it is, it is disgusting for them to think that by doing this Mass, they're obtaining some form of forgiveness. A most wicked infamy, unbearable blasphemy against Christ and his sacrifice. It diminishes the, the active work of Christ, the passive work of Christ, as our high priest. Go back and read later on the passage in Hebrews that we had. It tore that away. And all we are left with as as supposed children of God, is the fact is that we're not forgiven of our sins, and the robe of Christ's righteousness that we are supposed to be wrapped around with is nothing more than the little scarf that's put around us for display. We are of men most miserable. So it occurred to Martin Luther and many others, but especially to Luther after he became convinced that the scriptures were the only authority for the believer, the notion that all who believe are priests, the priesthood of believers. He saw that all Christians are equally Christian because nobody is superior to anybody else, especially, as he said, in what really counts, a relationship to God. There's no believer around the world that is any closer to God than any other believer because the sacrifice was equally the same for one as for the other. The priesthood of believers says, I have had such access because of what Christ has done. As Luther studied the book of Romans, it allowed him to see that in and through Jesus Christ, a believer possesses the righteousness of God and therefore had immediate access to God without the mediation of an egotistical priest. He doesn't have to go there. He doesn't have to do that. I can go and talk to him at any time. I am free. We mentioned his 95 theses that he tacked on the door at the Church of Wittenberg. Number 36 and number 37 
This rebellious monk said, quote, Every truly contrite Christian has plenty of remission from punishment and guilt due to him, even without letters of pardon, meaning of indulgences. Every true Christian, whether living or dead, has a share given to him by God in all the benefits of Christ and the church, even without letters of pardon. They didn't realize the benefits of what Christ had given us at the cross. And the church was robbing them, taking them away, making them feel as less than they should. Luther insisted that everybody who trusted in Jesus Christ is a priest. He wrote that his hope is one day when, quote, we shall recover the joyful liberty in which we shall understand that we are all equal in every right, and that shall shake off the yoke of tyranny, and shall that he who is a Christian has Christ, and he who has Christ has all things, because all things are Christ and can do all things. I used to have a dear lady when we were back in the church in Apollo. She's with the Lord now. And she said, I came out of a Roman Catholic background. And she says, I really was one who read my Bible. And I got to this point of, of forgiveness and why I had to come to the priest. And I came to him with open Bible. And he says, why is this confessional thing? And why all this? And he had an open Bible. He says, he didn't have an answer. And she says, finally, the Lord just says, get out. And she did, and, and she says, it was just like my eyes were open and this big burden was off, and the joyful, as, as, as Calvin wrote, this joyful liberation that she received to know that I can talk to the Lord any time of the day or night, and he hears me. He forgives me as I come to him and open my heart to him. So how did the Roman Catholic Church usurp or, or take over, uh, rob the church of the doctrine of Christ as high priest. How did this thing develop? Because it always wasn't like that. Practically speaking, it was done by the sin of unbelief and the sufficiency of Christ to have once offered up himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and to sufficiently reconcile us to God as well as adequately continue to make intercession for us. In other words, they didn't believe what the Westminster Confession said, the, the, the question 44 in the Catechism. They didn't believe that what Jesus Christ had done is sufficient for all, and that right now he alone stands as our intercessor. They didn't believe it. By necessity, the Church of Rome distorted the doctrine of Christ as priest because of their own lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and their own pride of life. But it was practically accomplished by keeping the laity ignorant of the scriptures. If you don't know your Bible, you're not going to know what it teaches. So you are bound to be followers of the one who says, this is what it says. In Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, I want to read verses 13 through 15 out of the CMV. That's the Coleman Modern Version. And don't try and buy this if there isn't any. But woe unto you, archbishops and cardinals, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, priests and bishops, hypocrites, for ye devour the widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, Roman Catholic clergy, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus speaks to them. Church history provides us with a few writings that became sparks that bursted into flames and united those who were heretofore too afraid to speak up. They had been given such understandings. Salvation had been commercialized. 
predicated upon church membership and earthly works instead of the fact that it was a gift that was bought by Christ's death upon the cross. The church had not only lost its fundamental authority over salvation, but it completely obscured the work of Christ as our great high priest. Totally covered up, not to be seen. And actually, in doctrine and practice, the church substituted itself for Jesus Christ as the great high priest. No longer did Christ the high priest remain in the, in the preeminent picture of the people, but the church came and it sat itself in front of that. The reformers, in return, sought the people to read the scriptures. John Huss sought to redirect the church of Bohemia back to the scriptures. Martin Luther completed his translation of the New Testament from Greek into German. Soon as William Tyndale to follow in English, and others in French and Dutch and Swedish and Spanish and Italian, and Czech and Hungarian and Arabic, soon the written word echoed in the lecture rooms, in the debate halls, in the pulpits, in all parts of Europe. It's interesting that today the Roman Catholic Church admits that there is or there had been an emphasis upon the scriptures in the Protestant Reformation. And I take this from the Catholic commentary on the Holy Scriptures, quote, through Luther, although Calvin seems to have been the first to announce the monobiblicism clearly, the Bible became the arm of the Protestant revolt. Okay? Catholic Church, looking back to the to 500 years ago, 600 years ago. And he says, for the Protestants, the Bible became the key to their revolt. But listen to this. A dumb and difficult book was substituted for the living voice of the church in order that each one should be able to make for himself the religion which suited his feelings. And the Bible open before every literate man and woman to interpret for themselves was the attractive bait to win adherence. Do you hear what he said? They said the reason that the Bible became the, 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 the key for the Protestant Revolution because it was a bait that they hung out that you all could get a Bible and read it yourself but you don't have the ability to understand it like you should. That's what he called them. It, it was a dumb and, and difficult book substituted for the living voice of the church. I give you a book, but the church holds much more than what you have in your hand. He says it was a carrot being hung out. Come on, join us, we'll give you a Bible. They saw that and they said, this book stands against it. The third and final point this morning is how this doctrine of Christ as high priest is being threatened today and how we need to defend it. How we need to defend it. I spoke earlier of the Roman Catholic Church's chameleon-like qualities, their ability to change and adapt over the centuries, in various cultures and situations yet remain truly the Roman Catholic Church. Take, for example, the priesthood of believers. We've mentioned it. But here John Calvin writes, For we who are defiled in ourselves, yet are priests in Christ, offer ourselves and are all to God, and freely enter the heavenly sanctuary that sacrifices of prayers and praise that we may be acceptable and a sweet smelling before God. He recognized in Christ every believer is the priest. So Catholic Church says, whoa, we got to do something about that. You know, if we have priests who are like that, well, what about the, this Protestant idea? So this is what they did. 1992, they completed the Catholic Catechism. Here's a section on the sacraments. Paragraph 1591, we read. The whole church is a priestly people. Oh, that sounds pretty much like the Protestants, doesn't it? Priesthood of believers? The whole church is a priestly people. 
Through baptism, all the faithful share the priesthood of Christ. Right? Very similar. The participation is called the common priesthood of the faithful. Based on this common priesthood and ordered to its service, there exists another participation in the mission of Christ. The ministry conferred by the sacrament of holy orders, where the task is to serve in the name and in the person of Christ, the head in the midst of the community. Every believer, everybody who's been baptized in the Catholic Church is a priest. But out of those, there is a special priesthood of service. Hence, they support their own priesthood. The chameleon changed on the outside. We'll use words that you all use, but in truth, we remain the same because the priest remains the key for you to understand the scriptures and interpret these things honestly. Back in January of 1959, when Pope John XXIII announced the creation of the Second Vatican Council, it shook the world because there hadn't been a Vatican Council in nearly 100 years. After World War II, there were a lot of changes in cultures and in lifestyles, and the church decided that something had to be done. So Vatican II came out with 16 documents that laid the foundation of the church as it's known today. The documents were themed on reconciliation, in other words, getting along with each other, getting along with each other. In keeping, they allowed Catholics to pray with other Christian denominations. They encouraged friendship with other non-Christian faiths as well as other changes. All of a sudden, the chameleon is saying, well, we're dropping our, our bar a little bit here on the outside. Royal Catholic and Protestant dialogue has increased with greater intensity over the past 50 years or so. And those of you who are old enough to recognize that know that today there is more of a, a, a relationship between Catholics and Protestants than ever before openly. Well, Catholic apologists will often, will often criticize the monks and the priests of the Middle Ages, saying that those people way back 500 years ago were overcome with greed. That's why they did what they did. But they do not represent the official position of the church. They do not represent the official doctrines of the church. Look online today and there will be numerous articles and blogs and editorials that have been published by Catholic church, clergy saying that we, the Protestants, have it all wrong. You don't understand us. The Protestant view of the Roman Catholic theology is blown way out of proportion. There's a tremendous push to unity, eliminating any reference to doctrinal distinctives and emphasizing the things that we have in common. I mentioned earlier, we're saved by faith. Oh, we're saved by faith too. But there are a few words that, you know, we add and they leave out. Well, we use the Bible. We use the Bible. You know, let's just, just unite on the things we have in common. And don't worry about the other things, you know, that are around there. We see a greater evangelical alliance with conservative Catholics because there's a shift away from theology to common cause, actions, and politics. Listen, if you would, to this Lutheran Catholic common commemoration of the Reformation of 2017. The awareness is dawning on Lutherans and Catholics that the struggle of the 16th century is over. Hello. The struggle of the Reformation is over. No more division. Let's just all hug each other and just bring together. The reasons for mutually condemning each other's faith have fallen by the wayside. Thus Lutherans and Catholics identified as they commemorate 2017 together. In 2017 we must confess openly that we, Catholics and Lutherans, <coughs> have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. This commemorative year presents us with two challenges, the purification and the healing of memories, and 
the restoration of Christian unity in the accordance with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, we need to get beyond it because Christ is calling for unity. <coughs> All right. He's taking it. But beyond the danger of falling into this ecumenical pit, finding a working, working fellowship amongst e ecclesiastical chameleons, many mainline denominations have already done that, and they had <coughs> <clears throat> almost made it and I have almost been in danger of losing their own position there's one more danger that I want to talk about and it's the practical understanding of the priesthood of believers the practical outworking of us as Christians as priesthood of believers I think one example can be seen on television when a Protestant minister is asking his viewers to send him their prayer request isn't that man implying that he as a minister is closer to God than ordinary Christians and therefore he's implying that God would rather hear him in great request rather than the others if that's not his intention there are others who hear that and believe that it's almost amazing that this man is offering to act as Pope for those who would write him, send in those requests, and I'm sure he expects a sizable seed offering to be included with those prayer requests. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever turned on the TV evangelist and he's sitting there with his wife and his other couple and around the table and he says, here's his request, here's a whole pile of, we're going to pray over these, and we're thankful for the seed money that was added onto it. Roman Catholics have only one pope, but Protestants have many. The biblical doctrine of the priesthood of all believers as we know it is truth denied, not only by Catholics, but by those who practice in Protestantism. What else would you call it when ordinary believers in Christ feel that they're not good enough to approach God, that they need an intermediary to pray on their behalf? and sometimes for a fee. There's money being made in evangelical popery today, just as it was in the Middle Ages by the Catholic Church. Solomon Rushdoony in his Institutes of Biblical Law wrote, the purpose of the church should not be to bring men into subjection to the church, but rather to train them in the royal priesthood capable of bringing the world into subjection to Christ the King. The purpose of the church is to train us as believers to understand we are priests before God, that we have access to the throne of God, and he desires all of us to come and to present unto him our petitions. In Christ, every Christian is an adopted son of God, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He has open access to the throne of grace, and as a royal priest, he serves God in gratitude for his salvation. He recognizes Jesus Christ alone as his mediator and high priest, whose sacrifice alone has led him into the Father's presence. Sacrificial service to God results from being enlightened of the scriptures and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the relationship that we as believers have. May our love for the truth of the scriptures the illumination of the Holy Spirit bring us to a practical understanding of God's gracious gift of the priesthood of believers, as well as the glorious and powerful ministry of our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, even though we approach your throne at this moment of our service with one audibly speaking we as a body are coming unto you from our hearts. For through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, we not only have access, but we've been brought into your family. And we come unto you as children unto the Father, and we cry, Abba, Father, and you hear us. 
So forgive us, Father, when we have found ourselves delighting in passing the buck, the prayer responsibility unto others, not realizing how you long to hear your children call upon you, how your heart's desire is for them to approach you at any time of the day or night, in any location, from the highest mountain to the depths of the sea, the psalmist says, you're there. May we not be fearful to come into your presence. And Father, open our eyes to the wiles of the devil, to the arsenal that he has laid before us, that through the clarity and the understanding of your word, we see the beauty of our Savior, and not through some interpretation of a supposed disciple, apostle, or any of those followers. But may the proclamation of the gospel from our lips and from our life be clear, proclaiming its fullness, even this day. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.